So every financial lecture always starts with the disclosure side saying that I'm not a financial advisor, please do your research before you actually do anything, it's for informational only, whatever, I don't make any money from this, yada, 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 so. All right, and like I said, this lecture is actually pretty hard to make because like I know where you guys are generally in like the medical knowledge world, so I could give a lecture medically to you guys pretty well, but financially or just with money wise, like there is incredible variation of um, where your guys' knowledge is. Some of you guys might have MBAs and be very financially um, savvy and some of you people may just hate money and never want to think about money and just want to get a financial advisor and just do your doctor stuff and that's fine. Yep. But there are some things you're going to have to learn how to do, um, even if it's just hiring a financial advisor, because soon you'll be expected to run your own finance for your house, your household, um, and even maybe even more than that as well. So um, a lot of QR codes. Uh, I'll give you guys the slides at the end of this lecture, um, and it's stuff I really wish I would have known. And like I said, White Cone Investor heavily influenced this lecture. So, all right. So. Uh, like I said, it's not usually taught uh, during uh, residency, this money stuff. And so you could be anywhere from this whole spectrum from hire your financial advisor, which is the most expensive route. So you can be all the way from this end where you're saying, hey, I don't want to do anything. I just want to hire, hire a financial advisor. It's going to cost me thousands. That's OK with me. I'm just going to do my doctor stuff. You might be a little bit more say, hey, you know what? I want to learn. I want to learn some stuff, take some online courses, white coat investor courses, whatever. I did uh, some in-person courses and do it myself still cost some thousands of dollars um, and you have to put in more effort but uh, I find this this probably uh, where this kind of like middle two is where I am here um, you could just read books obviously that's like 20 bucks I don't know, 40 bucks if you want to read a couple books um, more effort and then finally like scouring the blogs and stuff and it's the most amount of effort um, so I, again I'm, I fall somewhere in the middle it's okay if you fall on the spectrum but you just gotta learn some stuff with money so this is going to be the outline for my lecture. We're going to go through these six topics, um, starting with debt, because that's probably the most pressing thing that everyone has on their mind, all the way to income taxes, which you probably don't have in your mind, or if you're like me, I've never paid income taxes prior to um, graduating medical school. All right, so let's start off with debt. All right, so almost everyone graduates medical school with debt. And that's not True, there's about, I don't know, 20% of people that don't, but um, the average, the most recent one I could find was that the debt was about $250,000 for a graduating um, medical student, which is pretty high. And you need to figure out how to pay off this debt. It all feels like fun and games and you're borrowing all this money and you don't have to pay it back. And then all of a sudden, you know, residency, maybe you have to pay it back a little bit. And then all of a sudden when you become an attending, you're like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. That's real money. And so you need to figure out how to pay it back. So. One of the biggest things that the white coat investor stresses, and I will say not only white coat investor, but pretty much any financial person, is to become, uh, don't become debt numb or minimize your debts. So you don't, we'll talk about houses in a little bit. Houses are fine if you want to, but avoid the fancy house, uh, at least especially starting out with, or the fancy car. You can get reliable transportation for cheap. Um, you don't need a $30,000 car. Uh, don't get in the habit of saying, whatever, I already have $250,000, what's another $30,000 on that? Because that's a quick way to get yourself into a big hole that's gonna take you years to get out of. And then the worst is credit card debt. A lot of people, when I give this lecture every year, um, I often ask who has credit card debt. No one's ever like raised their hand, but that doesn't seem right that no one has credit card debt. Um, but on average, the average US citizen has, you know, a couple thousands in credit card debt at a rate of 16%, an incredible rate. So that's like just a hundred bucks a month to just to pay off the interest. So um, credit card debt is like, if you ever listen to like Dave Ramsey, which I'm not advocating you listen to Dave Ramsey, but he's very anti-debt. And so like having credit card debt is like a five alarm fire, pay it off immediately. And we could talk more about that, but it doesn't seem like that's the big problem here. It's more student loan debt. So there's two ways to get rid of your student loans. Uh, two major ways, I should say. There's other ways if you go in the military and things, but um, you could either do public service loan forgiveness or you can basically just pay it off. And when I say pay it off, I mean like usually you refinance your student loans and then pay it off as soon as you can once you become an attending. Um, and so refinancing that word, what does that mean? Well, it means you take out a new loan. So you have your, let's say, a student loan through the government at 7% interest and 
all of a sudden the interest rates are low. And so you find another bank to say, hey, I'll give you that same amount of money for a cheaper rate, maybe 4%. That's not exactly true in this day and age, or 5%. And I will pay off your government loan. And now you'll have a loan with me at 4 or 5%. And so you have refinanced your loan. You have gotten a new loan at a lower rate. And so that is refinancing. And usually it's a good idea. I mean, especially in the COVID times where like interest rates were like, I mean, they were zero for the government loans, but um, they were very low. Um, and we'll talk more about interest rates, but um, refinancing your loans and paying off the, the loans is the route that I took. Um, I had about $100,000 of student loan debt, which was great. My parents paid for part of medical school. So I had about $100,000 of um, loans. So I refinanced them right when I got out of medical school from like 7% to like, I think like four or 5% and then just paid it off as fast as I could over two years trying to, you know, not take on new debt. Um, so what did I say here? Oh yeah. So, um, okay. Let's talk first about public service student loan forgiveness. And I'll say that when I started medical school, like this was like a big like question, is this actually going to happen? Cause it's going to take 10 years to happen. Is it really going to happen? And the answer has actually been yes. There has been, I believe, I want to say at least four people I know, maybe five, that have actually just got their loans forgiven in the last couple of years through public service loan forgiveness. For those, I'm going to say four people, each had $200,000 of loans approximately, so about $800,000 of student loans were forgiven just for you know, a couple of my friends. So it is a real thing, uh, but you have to qualify. So, so if you don't meet all these criteria, you can't go for public student loan forgiveness. So do you work at full time for a government, an academic hospital, or some hospital employees like Vanderbilt. Um, so during residency and fellowship, you'll meet that criteria, that's fine. But if you are dead set on going to the community afterwards, you say, I don't like academics, which might be a little early, but like if you're like, I just wanna work in the community, then forget about public service loan forgiveness. You can't go through that route. Um, direct loans, you have to have direct loans to get this through the government. Some loans can be consolidated into direct loans, but they have to be direct loans. You have to make 10 years of payments, which 10 years of monthly payments, so 120 payments. Um, you're supposed to submit an annual certification form for your employee. employee. Um, I don't think that's mandatory, but I've run into people that have had problems if they didn't do this, that sometimes they come back and say, we weren't sure you were employed. So this is just an important part. Every year, say, send in this form, say you're employed, and save them because the government has a tendency to be slow and lose things. And then you have to be enrolled in one of the four income-driven repayment plans. Um, so I will, let me first off saying, I am not a student loan master. Uh, I had student loans. I'm kind of far out from them. There's been a lot of changes. I try and stay up to date, but I don't know the ins and outs of all these plans. So all I know is that I had to look this up. There's a new plan coming in. You guys probably know this called the save plan. So it's changing repay um, or it replaced repay already. And then IBR are the only two plans that are going to be left after July of this year. Pay and income contingent repayment are both going away in about a month or not a month, but four months. Um, so by the time you start residency, I guess the day you start residency, there will only be these two plans, save or IBR. Um, so here's a, a slide I stole from um, one of the white co investor lectures. And I thought this was good. So the income, so say as an intern, you make 60,000 per year. By the way, if any of you guys, anyone seeing a Vanderbilt for residency? Nice, all right, we got like four of you guys. Uh, did you guys just see the salary? $70,000 as an intern? What the, when I was a resident, I feel like it was like in the, low 50s or something. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's like the effect of time and just on my brain. Uh, but 70,000 for an intern. Uh, but 60,000 is, I think, a pretty reasonable number to, to go off of. How many people are in your family here? Cognizant that the lasers won't get you guys. So you look how many people, then you can figure out the poverty line here. And then you then if you look at the, um, the two most important ones, the, when I say new IBR, this is the ones if you took out loans after 2014, so within the last 10 years, that's the new one, um, or the SAVE program. This is going to be your monthly payments um, for uh, if you make $60,000. It doesn't matter how much actual money you have taken out. These are going to be your payments for like the SAVE plan. So if you're single, you're going to pay around $218. So I guess if you're at Vanderbilt and you make $70,000, it's going to be a little bit more. Um, but a lot of the, the interest, I believe, 
that is not paid is actually forgiven on the save plan. So um, yeah, it's, it's not too it's not too much if you're going through the save plan. This is actually a pretty reasonable amount compared to some of the private refinancing ones. Okay, when should you also consider public? Say, okay, I, I think I want to do academics. I'm going to be working at a community, excuse me, a uh, academic hospital. Um, now, should I do public service loan forgiveness? Well, the longer your residency and the because your pay is the lowest in residency and the higher debt burden you have, the more it favors public service loan forgiveness. And then the converse, if you have a short residency and lower debt, that favors refinancing and just paying it off. And so me, as an emergency medicine physician, uh, I had a three-year residency, as short as it can be, and I had $100,000, low as it can be. Not, sorry, not low as it can be, but relatively low. Um, and so I refinanced and paid for it. And if you look at emergency medicine here, uh, this is the 2023 annual compensations by specialty. Plastics, anyone going to plastics? Nope, no plastics. All right, ortho? All right, we got one ortho right here. Um, so this is the average. Now there's a lot of variability within the specialty. Like you could be an orthopedist doing a lot of like, you know, community care and stuff and not getting reimbursed. Or you could be just doing, you know, I don't know. I'm trying to think a lot of hand, hand surgery and make a lot more. But um, this is the average. And so emergency medicine always lands like dead in the center at 352,000. Now granted, if you're gonna do academics, usually you gotta shave off, you know, like a quarter of that to, to at least you know around a quarter or a third if you want to give the privilege to teaching rev residents. <laughs> um, so take off some amount of money to do academics. The Vanderbilt doc, you get the name Vanderbilt, you get to be an assistant professor <laughs> for tens of thousands of dollars. Um, the, the good part is there is also geographic variability. I haven't listed this here or showed it, an image, but the Southeast actually pays usually the most for, uh, Southeast United States pays the most uh, overall for um, doctors. So like Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, those states make, uh, the physicians make more money there. So maybe that's the loss of academics is partially offset by the geographic location. Anyways, so then you figure out your debt to income ratio. I had $100,000 of debt. I guess I could assume I'd be making around, let's say $300,000. My debt to, income, debt to income ratio was far less than one, so I refinanced and paid off. If it's around one or one and a half the ratio, then you say, oh, maybe public service, public service loan forgiveness is for me. And if you're over, I it used to say over two, but now the numbers is like over 1.5, you probably should consider it. So if you have, you know, five hundred thousand dollars in debt, and you're doing pediatrics. All I'm saying is, public service loan forgiveness looks pretty good. <laughs> Some stats of public service loan forgiveness. I try and update this every year. This was the most recent update that they've given. Um, they said nineteen thousand people have been uh, forgiven with their debt. Last time I had a number at, at two thousand people, so it's gone up a lot. Um, over almost two billion dollars of debt forgiven. Almost a hundred thousand dollars per person. Most applications are rejected when you apply. And why is that? Well, let's look at the breakdown. Okay, you don't have enough qualifying payments. That's an easy one to reject, right? You didn't make 120 payments. You're not getting forgiven yet. Um, fill, not filling out the form correctly. Man, the government loves a correctly filled out form. So you're getting rejected. And then this is the most painful one listening, uh, reading about. Not having the eligible loans. Like you actually had, did not have direct loans or you had some other loans. And you, you thought for 10 years that you were going to get public service loan forgiveness. And then they're like, hey, actually, those are the wrong loans. That is, that is painful. So um, just make sure you have the right loans. So this worry was a little bit greater in the past because before anyone had actually had money forgiven. But people for many years were like, I don't know if public service loan forgiveness is going to be around. Well, there's this idea uh, if you're either concerned that it's going to go away because technically – Congress could cancel it at any time. That would be probably a pretty big, um, like that would probably be a pretty big deal if they did that, but it's possible. Um, or uh, maybe they'll say that, you know, if you took out money after a certain time, you can't do it or whatever, whatever reason that public service loan forgiveness won't be around. You can do a side fund as an attending. So to say, you know what, I'm going to hedge my bets and say that it might not be around so I'm going to keep extra money on the side while I'm going through public service loan forgiveness, you know, doing the save plan and paying like $250 a month. I'm going to put some extra towards a side fund just in case this whole thing falls apart. Or maybe I go into community 
uh, you know, don't do academics or something, then I don't have the option to do public service loan forgiveness. So you basically take what you're expected to pay monthly with private refinancing, and then what you do pay for public service loan forgiveness. Um, I shouldn't, whatever plan you're on, I should say the save plan. Most people do the save plan here. And then you do the difference between the two and then put that amount either in a bank account or some people would say like in an, an investment account that's debatable. There's a lot of like, you know, things you could do, um, but every month. So like I just, I use this um, example a couple of years ago. I haven't updated the interest rates, but you can still get an idea. Say you had a family of five, two, you're going to assume your income is going to be 250,000. Your student loan debt's 300,000. You could refinance at 5% over 10 years. So that means in that scenario, as an attending, you'd be paying $3,200 a month. Whereas, oh, I didn't catch this edit here. The save payments uh, at when you're an attending would maybe be $1,800 a month. Remember, this is when you are attending. Um, so the difference would be $1,400. And so then I'm going to take that $1,400, that's mine, but put it away just in case public service loan forgiveness doesn't work. And again, this is to do when you're an attending, not when you're a resident. So this is a little bit farther out. Questions on that? All right, so this is this is one book. I'm going to list a couple books at the end. Um, I thought it was a pretty good book. I just completely ripped off his slide, um, but I thought it was pretty good. Did you file taxes as a fourth year med student? Uh, we're going to mention this in income taxes, but if you did not, if you haven't filed yet, you have one month left or three weeks left, you need to file your taxes this year. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, but you need to file your taxes. Um, then it goes if you're married and then blah, 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 and then you can follow this out. The slides will be out there, but it's basically figuring out if you're going to do public service loan forgiveness or if you're not. So assuming you're not going to do public service loan forgiveness, then refinance to lower interest rates. Most public, uh, the federal loans, I don't know, seven or eight percent. Anyone want to throw out what percentage they have right now? Seven, seven. Private refinancing. Okay, this is a white coat investor website. Again, I don't get paid by White Coat Investor. I just like their stuff. They have a vetted student loan refinancing site. I think there's eight people on it now, eight companies. I don't know. It always kind of fluctuates. Um, and depending on your uh, scores, you know, your like, um, uh, what, what am I trying to think of? Like your financial scores, your credit scores. That's what I'm talking about. You can get a uh, interest rate between five and nine percent. So ideally, it'd be around five, and not <laughs> you wouldn't want to refinance if you're going higher. They will often give you a little kickback bonus to get you in the door. So you get a couple hundred to maybe $1,700 back as a bonus um, just for doing the filling out their um, or getting a getting a loan through them. And uh, I got quotes from three different companies. I got I chose the one with the best reputation and the lowest interest rate. And I chose that one and I refinanced right out of um, right at the end of residency. All right. So I just want to mention fixed versus variable interest rates because most of these companies have either fixed or variable interest rates. I think there's an important concept, not only just for student loans, but also for like life, for mortgages, for, uh, you know, if you're getting a, any type of loan for cars, whatever, you're going to have often have the option. Do you want a fixed or variable interest rate? And to me, my parents were always like, get the fixed interest rate. It's just like warm and fuzzy and you know exactly, look at this interest rate line. Whoa, that's a straight line. You know exactly how much you're going to pay next month next year and five years from now you will know your monthly payments which is like gives you a sense of warmth and happiness um which is great okay it's more common because i think people are risk adverse um but the thing is it's a higher interest rate usually because you're essentially paying for what i'm going to explain the variable interest rate plus insurance just in case um you don't know this but you're paying for a variable rate plus a difference of insurance so the banks don't get um in trouble with giving you a loan at a low rate. And so, because what a variable interest rate is, it changes with respect to the economy. There's different um, things that you can look at called like usually called the LIBOR rate. Um, and they tack on a little bit extra over a LIBOR rate. And then they, that is your interest that you will pay for your loan that you know quarter or every six months or so. And they adjust it every couple months. And so if you were in the 1980s getting a home loan, like if you talk to a lot of your parents that uh, were getting mortgages in the 1980s, they're like, oh yeah, my home mortgage was like 18 to 20%, which is like unbelievable to think of because I bought my house in 2015 right here, <laughs> you know? Uh, so like the, the interest rate was very low. So this is actually not, 
this is the I think the LIBOR rate. So my interest rate for my home was initially like three and a half percent because I tack on a little bit extra, and then I refinanced you know during COVID times when the interest rate went even lower. Um, so the interest rate changes, and I got a variable rate for um, for my mortgage, and it worked out very well because I guess COVID hit. I would not say that that worked out well, but the interest rates went down, um, and my my house got my mortgage payments got cheaper, and I refinanced as well. So does that make sense? Fixed versus variable. All right. So that was the debt portion. Now we'll go to the savings portion. Um, so the concept of live like a resident is often repeated on the White Coat Investor Forums and on when Dr. Dolly speaks. Uh, but this idea that you should be able to keep your lifestyle during residency and after residency as you're accumulating wealth and paying off your student loans for at least a couple years after residency. And the truth is, like, you, you, you don't need to, like... We'll go through the savings rate, but you can give yourself little bonuses here and there or increase your lifestyle a little bit each year at a reasonable degree. It's the lifestyle jump that you don't want to take. And it's very easy once your paycheck gets big to take a big lifestyle jump. But, you know, going from residency to attending where your salary goes from, I'm going to say, 70000 to 300000 it's very easy to get comfortable buying a nice car or something like that. Um, but... You've been living off a $70,000 salary for multiple years. You can give yourself a $90,000 salary or a budget, if you will, and then save that other $210,000 towards something else and really increase your lifestyle to that $90,000 lifestyle while you're paying off your student loans. And they've shown, you know, like this, there's research on happiness and like, you know, you, like your maximum happiness is achieved at somewhere between $70,000 to $100,000 a year um, income. So... I updated the numbers, $70,000 a year at Vanderbilt. So that's almost six grand a month. Um, so you have to save four. So, I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't mention. They always repeat 20% of your income. 20% of your income has to be saved. 20% of your income. So if you're making 70,000, that means save $14,000 a year or about $1,200 a month. And you can put that to one of three things. You can either put that to paying off your student loans, which I don't really, yeah, this is it. These three are going to, you could argue all day long. This is like the most common question you get. What should I do with my money? Should I pay off my loans? Should I uh, invest it? Or should I put it in a savings account? And there's no right answer uh, at the time. You can always look back and say, oh, the stock market was hot this year. I should have put it in retirements. Or, you know, like, I don't know, the stock market was terrible. I should have just put it in my bank account. Um, but at the time, either one of these three options is a very reasonable option. If you're doing public service loan forgiveness, you probably don't want to pay down your student loans quickly. So you're probably not going to do number one. Um, you probably want to build up a nice savings account, at least for a couple months salary first. So probably funnel it more into savings initially. You can invest in uh, residency, which is great. You can pay off your student loans. Whatever you do with it, just save 20% of your pre-tax income. And it's not a huge amount right now, but it's more of the idea of getting used to saving your money that's it's a nice habit to get into it's just like exercise you just kind of the more you do it the more you are more likely to do it in the future this is white coat investor jim dolly emergency doc in utah and he says he makes his joke often or joke um, if you can't live well on a 80 uh, percent of a physician income you have a spending problem not an earning problem he often says that in Medical students and residents think that's a funny joke, and then attendings, especially late career attendings, do not think that's very funny because a lot of them don't have a lot of wealth accumulated. They often mention, you know, historically physicians have been targets towards a lot of financial, um, uh, unscrupulous financial professionals that are trying to get, you know, make some money because as physicians, we have high incomes and we don't want to deal with our money, and so we just want to offload it, cognitively offload it to someone else, and so we're very trusting and we just give it to the, you know, whatever person and we lose money in the, um, during that time. Um, so we are a target and there hasn't been a lot of good financial education during residency. So a lot of the late career doctors don't have this information, which I think is the white coat investor and some of the following people. So this is why savings rates really important. So there's a lot of assumptions built into this. So don't like fight this number. I understand. Yes. There's assumptions of how much you, uh, are um, uh, like how much interest is, or how much like the stock market returns and stuff like that. But in general, if you have, if you save 20% of your um, savings, you will take a little over 30 years to 
to reach, reach financial independence or the time where you are, um, are, you know, financially you can do whatever you want. You have enough money to cover the rest of your life. So that's why you have to see at least 20%. Again, once I finished re residency, I was probably like, maybe over here. I was like, I'm going to do this. I got really into finances. I got really cheap. I was eating ramen a lot, you know? Um, so uh, I was here and I probably had some like, it probably like negatively affected my life in some ways. Like I was like, okay, maybe I got to pull it back a little bit. And that's where my wife helped me and move to maybe around this area here. So if you're saving 40%, you can retire in 20 years. Um, I think that's a pretty reasonable uh, goal as a, as a physician, but just know it should be at least be 20 years, 20%, excuse me. 20%. So um, uh, an important part of personal finance is a budget. Um, there's a lot of apps like you need a budget um, or, forget, uh, you know, Mint or I'm forgetting all the other names um, that will help you with budgeting. But there should be some idea of where your money is going. I don't necessarily like some people like you need a written financial plan. Uh, White Co Investor says it a lot. I don't have a written financial plan. Maybe that's bad, but I have a plan and I follow it through in my head and it's not on paper. So, you know, I, I don't care if it's written as long as you have some understanding of where your money is going. So if you make $70,000 a year as an intern, Again, that's about six grand a month. So you have some fixed costs, stuff that you cannot change or at least have minimal change on. So you have taxes. You're not going to change that. Luckily, Tennessee is pretty low income tax. So assuming you're single in Tennessee, you're going to pay about I don't know, six, a little over $600 a month in taxes at the end of the year. That's how much it works out to be. I don't know if housing and utilities I increases, increase this number every year. Is that a reasonable amount, $2,200 for housing and utilities nowadays? Okay. All right. Um, it was, it used to be far too low. And then you have your savings that we talked about. Remember, um, this actually should be $1,400. I apologize. I didn't update that, but saving 20%. Then you get your car, gas, insurance to get to and from work. Okay. Cell phone plan. This one is, I get a lot of questions on this one. So I actually made a link here. This is where I'm going to go and say, there is, is a link to a cell phone plan for $25 a month because I get asked about it so much. Um, it if you there's too many people paying like 60 to 80 dollars a month for their cell phone plans assuming your phone is paid off that's a, i guess a big caveat there are plenty of other companies that actually use the big three networks data and will sell it to you for much cheaper so this one's called visible it's actually owned by verizon it's literally owned by verizon it gets the best uh coverage if you want a cheap cell phone plan go for it um, you get like, it is my referral link. So this is now I look like I'm, I'm like a dirty car salesman right now, but it saves you $20 off of normal. So that's my, so it saves you money. So there you go. Um, I use mint mobile. So I actually tried, I'm so cheap. I tried like four different plans over the course of four years. I tried mint mobile, which is T-Mobile. Um, it uses the T-Mobile stuff, and T-Mobile works like crap at Vanderbilt, so can't do T-Mobile here. Verizon has the best coverage. It's the cheapest. It's unlimited. It's very easy. So this is the one I recommend when people ask me, like, why do you only budget $25 for a cell phone plan? That's how much it should be. Uh, and then finally, insurance. We haven't talked about it. I could talk another hour and a half on just insurance, um, but it's going to be a couple hundred bucks. And then you have variable costs. This is the big stuff. So this is taking your salary, taking out your fixed costs. You need your variable costs to be less than that amount. So if you go, obviously you need some groceries, but then you get restaurants, some bars, some Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, whatever, DoorDash. And then, so you get about a thousand dollars on variable costs after paying off all this stuff, which is a pretty reasonable amount. So now you have, you're paying your taxes, you're paying your housing, you're saving for retirement, and you still have a thousand dollars of variable um, costs. So you can still go to nice restaurants every once in a while. This we in America we have a progressive tax system, so meaning this is from 2022. So these numbers aren't exactly. I just haven't found a good slide to update this to, but up to ten thousand um, uh, dollars. Let's see. So sorry, yeah, up to ten thousand dollars, ten thousand two hundred seventy-five dollars. You get ten percent tax rate, and then from that amount to the next bucket here, this is tax of so 41,775, you get taxed at 12%, and then you go up to this bucket and it gets to 
but then you get taxed at 22%. So making more money, yes, you get high, taxed at a higher rate if you made an extra dollar over here, but it doesn't, that doesn't mean that your entire salary for the entire year gets taxed at 22% because the majority of the tax occurs at these two brackets here at 10 and 12%. Okay, yeah, so you can go out and still have some go to bars and restaurants. Just make sure that you're paying attention to how much you're spending generally every month or two so you don't go crazy. All right. Um, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but if you have extra income, like if someone gives you money, parents, gifts, whatever, what should you do with it? And we're in a unique situation where at this point, if you've matched, you have a guaranteed employment. This isn't the same as like a Dave Ramsey, like I don't know what I'm gonna do for you know next month because I don't have a job. You definitely have a job. You probably can look up your salary right now and it's gonna start paying you, you know, in, well, if you start working in July, you probably get paid in um, August. But if you get some extra money, hey, number one, pay off your credit card debt. We mentioned this earlier, 16, 18% credit card debt. You gotta get rid of that as soon as possible. I actually, I guess I agree with Dave Ramsey on that, like pay that off as quickly as possible. You can build up an emergency fund. This is most commonly done second. So you have a couple months buffer in case something happens, your car breaks down or whatever, life happens and you need a thousand dollars here or there. If you have a little extra money, put it in an, a Roth IRA. We're gonna talk about investing in a second, but that is a retirement account that you can put money into um, to let it grow with the stock market. And then, you know, maybe treat yourself, buy something, not nothing too crazy, but just buy something nice, um, not too nice. Uh, and so this is generally what you can do with extra money, because I get that question a lot. What can I, what should I do with my money either now or in the future? Okay, so retirement plans, um, I mentioned I, the word IRA um, on my last slide. The IRA, Okay, you can think of retirement plans as two big buckets. There's actually, there's plenty of more buckets, but if you want to make it easy, um, my laser pointer is now totally dead. Uh, you have your employer ones that you get your retirement through your employer here, your 401k or 403b. Those are, you can essentially think of the 401k and 403b as the same thing. It just depends on like the tax status of the place you're working at. So at Vanderbilt, we're 403Bs, whereas in most of like, you know, corporate America are 401Ks, doesn't really matter. Um, solo 401Ks if you own your own business. And then there's the self-funded plans, which are completely independent of the employer plans, which are called IRAs or individual retirement accounts. And so um, those are, are going to be a great uh, investment tool as you get a little bit older, but uh, like out of residency, but while you're in residency, most of the time you don't have to deal with either the IRAs or solo 401k since you're probably not owning your own business. Each one of these has a maximum amount that you can put in it. Uh, I think it's $23,000 on one of my other slides. So that means in 2024, you can only put $23,000 in here. Now that is a massive amount for a resident, right? If you're making 70,000, you you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to put $23,000 in one of these accounts. So when you're attending though, and your income's 300,000, and now you have to save 20%, which is what? $60,000 a year. It's very easy to fill one of these up. And so now you, you fill up the 23,000, and now you have to find more places to put the money. And so then you start using your IRAs. When, I, when you say IRA or 403B, you're talking about the traditional one. So some people don't use the word traditional, but you're talking about a traditional one. And so that is, money that you put into the account that is tax-free now, but when you pull it out in retirement, you're gonna get taxed on it, okay? Roth is the exact opposite. So the taxing still occurs. You all, Uncle Sam is always gonna get paid. Depends when he gets paid. Roth means you're getting taxed now, but when you pull it out in retirement, there's no tax. This is a critical, critical distinction because you're almost like set up for a, um, for a uh, a win here as a resident because your tax your tax rate when you're a uh, resident is going to be the lowest possible in the for the rest of your life should be at least it's probably going to be the lowest possible for the rest of your life so you want to oftentimes you're going to want to take advantage of the Roth account because you want to pay taxes now so when you're in a tax bracket say your tax bracket is you know 11% as we talked about your your effective tax is like 11%. When you're in attending, your effective tax is gonna be like 30%. So you'd rather pay the 10% the now rather than the 30% later, if possible. 
Now, as you alluded to, if you were going, definitely going for public service loan forgiveness and you want to try to get a lowest payment possible so you don't pay stuff back, um, pay as much uh, of your student loans back, you may put it in traditional. But if, you're, if you want to try and figure out the difference here, that is an intense calculation because you have to have a lot of like, a lot of uh, variables on this. And so there are companies like studentloanadvice.com, again, I don't take any money from them, but they're often on um, White Coat Investor, that will actually like figure out with your married, single or married status, with the number of kids you have, with the other spouse's job, if you do one versus the other, what state you're in, <clears throat> all those variables can play into which is better if you're doing public service loan forgiveness. So it might be worth it um, if you're definitely going for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, contribution limit, 23,000. You're not going to hit that in residency unless you have a high income earning spouse. Okay, we talked about the progressive tax system. Now let's go through some specifics of Vanderbilt. And feel free if you guys um, want to pull up your, your residency institutions page. They should have a lot of this information um, and ask questions about it. I'd be happy to answer them. So at Vanderbilt, first year, you do, they do not pay you or they do not put any money <clears throat> into your retirement. Starting your second year, they will start giving you money for retirement. They will put 3% of your retirement account into retirement, excuse me, 3% of your paycheck into your retirement account. And it's mandatory, meaning they just take that 3%, regardless of what you say, it goes into your retirement. But they match that, which is great. So if you're making, so the R2 salary is 72,000, holy moly. So 3% mandatory, they're going to take $2,174 out of your paycheck over that year, but they will match it and give you the exact same amount into your retirement account. Then you have the option of an additional 2%, which is $1,500. I highly recommend you take that 2% that, that match because that is free money. The match is free money. Um, so if you have the ability, meaning you are not paying off another high interest loan like a credit card debt, it's free money and it's worth almost two grand. So you should do it. Um, and you can put it in the Roth or traditional account. Again, in general, Roth is going to be better unless you have some specifics for public service loan forgiveness. All right. Once you put money into an account or into uh, your retirement, like what is your retirement account? Okay. So your retirement account at Vanderbilt is a Fidelity account. They have partnered with Fidelity. Could be different at different institutions, but here they will put your money in a Fidelity retirement account. Um, and there are about 26 options you can take in that Fidelity retirement account. Last time I checked. If anyone wants to correct me, feel free. But I am going to recommend, and pretty much everyone in the financial, uh, the, uh, in finances that is caring about your money is going to recommend the same thing. The White Coat Investor and pretty much both. Is anyone familiar with Bogleheads? Jack Bogle. So Jack Bogle was the um, starter of Vanguard. Um, he was very much on like a uh, uh, trying to get people to take their own personal finance and get people to invest and try and do it at the easiest way. And so a lot of people that follow this kind of simple principle are called Bogleheads and there's a website called Bogleheads. But anyways, the, you want to invest in something that's low cost, broadly diversified, and as an index fund. So let me define each one of those. Low cost. So when we say cost in terms of um, investment funds, we're talking about something called an expense ratio or the ER. And that is the percentage of um, the percentage of your investment that is taken out for uh, to pay the company to run the fund. So right, so all these companies have to make money somehow, right? They have to pay their employees and pay for supplies and whatever. So they need to make some money. Um, so the expense ratio is a way to find out how much they make. And so 0.2% is, is kind of a reasonable amount, 0.2% or less, um, but you can get most investments for under 0.05%. Okay, so, uh, so if you want to use just a, a general idea, if you invest $10,000 and you have an expense ratio of 0.2, then you're paying 20 bucks a year for your investment. You're paying it towards essentially Fidelity or whatever um, investing company you have. And that seems pretty reasonable, 20 bucks. Um, when I say broadly diversified, I mean that it has numerous stocks in it. So you can get, with one purchase of one fund, you can get uh, 
numerous stocks to minimize your risk. So the S&P 500 is a classic one. We love the S&P 500. It's an index fund, um, which has about 500 stocks in it, 500 of the biggest United States stocks. Um, there's another one called the Total Stock Market Index Fund that has every stock in the United States. I think it's the United States. And it has 3,600 stocks. I will be honest, they are almost the exact same though, because these 500 stocks weighted for what they are, basically trump all the little tiny, you know, 3,000 other stocks that are there. So, you know, the Apples, the Googles, the Metas, the Teslas are going to um, just outweigh all these little guys. So they're about the same. Um, they're very broadly diversified. They have a lot of uh, overseas um, investment, uh, like they have a lot of business overseas as well. So you can almost think of it, even though it's a U.S. thing, you also are getting some um, international coverage. And it's an index fund. Index fund is this this collection of stocks or bonds that tracks um, some other index. And that when I say S&P 500, that's a the technical standard and poor's 500 index, the index of the 500 biggest United States companies. So you want, or I usually have an S&P 500 index fund. Yeah. Do all investments or products Expense ratio? Yeah, they, they should all have it somewhere. And I'll show you here. Let me, let me slip, jump ahead here on both sides. Okay, so this is a typical, this is the S&P 500 at, at uh, oh, this is Vanguard I picked. I, maybe last year or something. So this is, um, I believe it's called VIIX. I don't remember the actual name. Oh, yeah, yeah, VIIX. Um, so if you look here, the expense ratio is listed here and it's 0.02%. So two bucks every $10,000 invested. So you can look at the expense ratio. They should be, it should be listed somewhere on the, on their pages. So going back, okay, this is just a, a visual representation of what it is to get an S and P 500. So you could go through and try and buy all these different stocks at certain amounts. and It would be a headache and crazy. Or you could just buy one single fund, an index fund that invests in all these. And with one purchase, you basically buy all these companies. So you're a part owner in all these companies. Um, if anyone has any advanced financial um, knowledge, you're going to hate this slide. This is boiling it down. And this is like, this is cringeworthy sometimes. But sometimes people don't know the difference between stocks and bonds. In general, stocks are going to be more risky but more reward, just like the typical um, saying in finances, the more risk, the more reward, or more potential reward, I should say. It doesn't always lead that way. Bonds are less risk, less reward. Now, that is, I am like completely not explaining really what they are, but I'm just saying this is how to think of them, okay? Riskier versus less risk. And so what the general idea of this is, is that you should have more stocks the younger you are because that's more aggressive. You're more aggressive in your early ages you're, um, they're, when you're um, just building wealth. You have time to be aggressive, right? If there's a big stock market decline, that's not going to be as bad as if you're just about to retire next year and the stock market drops 30% and now you expected to have $3 million in your bank account and you only have two. That's a lot worse. If that happens now, you go from you know 30000 to 20000 not that big of a deal. You can make it back up with um, with um, working more. And so I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly how aggressive you should be, meaning what percent stocks and what percent bonds. But in general, you should be more aggressive than what other people are at your age. Because you're just starting out, you're going to be like, if you read like a normal financial book, it's going to tell you to not be that aggressive. But since you guys are just starting your financial like big earning, for most of you, again, I'm talking generalities, you should be pretty aggressive. And I'm almost, I, I used to be 100% stocks and maybe I'm like 5% bonds now. I'm still very aggressive, even I'm 40 years old. So even at 40 years old, um, I'm still like 95, five. So still very aggressive. And the truth is, <laughs> the real truth is you should invest as much in stocks as you can handle. Because the, the thing that happens with investing in stocks is that they fluctuate a lot. And so when COVID hit, the stock market went down, I don't know, 20, 25%, like very quickly. That freaked people out. And then what, what, what do people do when the stock market goes down 25%? What do, you, what do people do? Not what should you do. What do people do? 
they sell. They say, oh my God, this is getting hammered. I don't want to be, I don't want to have any part of this. I'm getting out, sell. And you just sold off. And what should you do? Buy more. You should buy more. You should buy low. Now, this is assuming you're investing not in some crazy startup or Bitcoin or something like that. You're investing in the S&P 500, which is essentially like the U.S. economy. So unless you think the U.S. economy is going to go under, I mean, if you think that, okay. But if you don't think, if you think the U.S. economy is going to actually make it, um, you should be buying more. So there are target date interest. So these are the these are some of the 26 in, uh, investment options at VUMC. And there are something called target date investment funds. Wow, that's great. Um, and so what you do, instead of taking out the stocks to bonds and like, I don't want to have to figure out like, you know, we're doctors. We want to just do like doctor stuff. We don't want to deal with like what percent stocks do I need? So there's a target date retirement fund. Um, and so these, they're all acronyms, but Vanguard Institutional Target Retirement 2025 or 20, you know, every five years, there's a new one. And so you basically pick the one that you think you will, in the year you will retire, obviously not knowing what year you will retire, and it will do all the work for you. It will buy the certain number of stocks versus a certain number of bonds, and every year it will rebalance, meaning buy more stocks, or buy more bonds, or do all that stuff. And it's kind of nice. Um, it does all of it for you. Um, I recommend being as liberal as possible with your retirement date because, as you know, the sooner your retirement is, the less aggressive you get. And so they follow that same pattern. So if you picked a 2020, sorry, this is a couple of years old. They, these don't exist anymore. But if you picked a 2025 retirement, it's going to be a lot less aggressive than a 2065 retirement. So, you know, pick one 30 years out. <laughs> Wait, you're 20, so 2055 or something, 2060 or something. So you can be a little bit more aggressive. Um, and you can just pick a target date retirement fund. Now they do, I guess there's 12 of them or there were 12 of them. Um, they do charge a little bit more. Their expense ratio is 0.09%. And so when you get in like the nitty gritty, if you're like someone that like is really trying to deal with the minutia of finances, maybe you're like, oh, that's too much. But in general, that's still a small amount. And it's just a nice brainless way to um, invest your money. So target date index funds, if you wanna get a little bit more hardcore, I mentioned this earlier, the Vanguard Institutional Index Fund Institutional Plus Shares. Great name. Great. They nailed that one. VIIX is the ticker. And so that's the S&P 500 fund. And the expense ratio is even cheaper, 0.02%. And then there is a bond fund as well, the VBTIX. Um, I guess I didn't write the expense ratio, but that's the same thing with the bond, um, with the, with the bond market um, if you want to invest in bonds, which again, I don't really recommend right now. We talked about the expense ratio. Okay, I think this is a very telling graph. I love this graph. This is the S&P 500 uh, fund on a logarithmic scale since its inception in like 1925 or something. So if you look at the general trend of the S&P 500, it is going up, it is going up. There are some big dips. There are some notable dips. This one right here hurts a lot to look at. You invested all your money right here and then uh, what is it called? The Great Depression. Boom, you lost 90% of your money within, I don't know, a couple months or something. Uh, yeah, that one hurts. That one's going to take you uh, about 30 years to recover from. But assuming you don't have a Great Depression event in your lifetime, which we hope, there's, there is a very common and expected dips throughout the time. These dips that don't look like big compared to the Great Depression, but they hurt, man. They hurt once your money's in there. Um, this one, 2009 financial crisis, wait, yeah, 2009 financial crisis, that one, you know, people thought it was the end of the world right here and look at how it just wasn't that much. And we recovered from it in like, I think this was like a five-year recovery. Don't quote me on the exact numbers, but around a five-year recovery, if you invested all your money. Now, generally, hopefully you're investing multiple times, multiple points of time over the length of this. So it's not like you invested there and then you sold here, but you, you got money in here. The stock market went down. You bought more because you thought America wasn't going to fail. And then look at how much it's been since 2009. It's just been bonkers. And then look at this, COVID. People thought COVID was the end of the world. Um, there was a 20% drop right there. That hurt, but it went up and we're above COVID times. And I think the stock market hit an all-time high within the last week or something. So, um, yeah. And if you ever read, this is just one thing I like to put up. If you ever read like how much the stock market returns, it's always good. People will say, oh, it returns 10% per year. And 
this and that and the other, but you should really use like 7%. And the reason I say this is this is the right, this is generally the amount if you account for inflation, which is important. So you have to account for inflation. So if you want to make mathematical models of your money over time for retirement, it says, how much do you expect to earn each year over 30 years of your career? You should probably use 7% if you want to use history as a, um, as a uh, guide. All right, here's just another graphical representation of what I'm talking about. This one only, uh, this one stopped in 2018, so it didn't get the COVID times in it. But a bull market is good. I, I, who, I don't know who created the term bull. I'm sure there's a great story behind it. Bull markets are good. Bear markets are bad. Bear markets are red. Bull markets are blue. And if you look graphically from 1966 to 2018, the bull versus bear markets. And if you notice that the stock, 75% of the time, the stock market is going up. And when I say stock market, again, I'm not talking about individual stocks. I'm talking about the general stock market. It's going up. These are big, profitable periods of time mixed with, you know, some hard 50%, look at 50% loss over three years right there. It doesn't look big, but that's a pretty hard loss. This is sustained 50% of your money in three, uh, over a three year time period. Um, but if you kept your money in it, look at what comes next. You got 340% increase. So anyways, that I think I've beat a dead horse. Okay. So a couple book recommendations. Um, these are uh, all books that I've read. Um, it all started with the OG White Coat Investor book. Uh, I think this book is a great spot, uh, place to start. Um, I also like this one. This one's more kind of like uh, medical school, intern year. And then you go on to, this one is amazing for mid-residency to get your financial career or financial life straight. It's basically like, hey, first thing you need is disability insurance. This is how much you need based on your lifestyle or whatever. Go buy it here and then come back to the book. Okay, this is how much uh, dis uh, I said disability life insurance you need. This is how much you need to buy. This is how you buy it. Go buy it and then come back. And it basically does this, I don't know, 12 times. And then you finish the end of the book and your whole life is in, uh, is in order. Okay, maybe not your whole life, but at least your money. Um, and then Simple Path to Wealth. This one is great. This one's like, it still talks about money. This is one of the books where it's more like behavioral. Um, it talks a lot about how to invest money and how to think of money. It's really good. It all started with this um, uh, kind of elderly gentleman writing letters to his daughter about finance. He was a financial person and wrote letters to his daughter and it became very popular. And then he put them online for free. And so you can still get them online for free, I believe. But he's kind of like cleaned it up a little bit and put it into book format. And it is just such a good book to read about um, uh, to think how to think of money. And then finally, uh, oh, if someone call it, so people bring up the idea of a $2 million book. Like if someone said, I will give you $2 million to read this book right here, would you read it? Damn right you would. You'd, you'd read it today. You'd pick, buy it, pick it up, read it, and finish it today if they gave you $2 million. But no one's going to do that. But what if it gave you $2 million over the course of your career? Um, and of course, I don't know how much it has made me, but I'm sure that this is at least, a, this has acted as a gateway to a financial knowledge and abilities that have at least earned me um, uh, multi-million dollars over the course of my career. So um, I highly recommend this one. Now there is a new book. I haven't read it. First off, this is supposed to be really good. It has really good reviews. Um, has anyone read it here? Has anyone read the OG White Coat Investor? No? I highly recommend you guys just at least start with this one. I'm sure this one's great too, but I, I just don't know enough about it. Yes. Yeah. So, so Jim Dolly, the white coat investor is, gives this one for free. There should be a Vanderbilt champion that gets all the books for your class and then distributes them out. I don't know who that person is. You guys can maybe find them if you don't have the book already, but if you do good job for the, uh, for the Vanderbilt champion here. A lot of people like podcasts because they're listening to stuff when they drive. Um, this is uh, probably the best one that I found. Um, there's a lot of ones that aren't really dedicated to physician finance, which I find is important because we're kind of an outlier um, with our high debts, our high income potentials, and just like general not wanting to learn about <laughs> finances uh, for a lot of people. So this is a really good one geared towards um, uh, medical professionals. Okay, second to last topic. We've been going, let's see, my phone is, let's see what time it is. 1040. So we have 20 more minutes here. Um, 
And we're gonna talk about buying versus renting. Okay, everyone that finishes residency wants to buy a house. That's like the new thing, to buy a house. Um, I'm gonna stand here and say, you probably shouldn't do that. Now, a lot of you won't listen to me and you'll buy a house, but I'm gonna tell you anyways, you probably shouldn't do it. Now, granted, if you have a residency that's longer, that's better, that gives you more incentive to buy a house, residency plus fellowship, I should say, um, because you'll be at the same spot. But uh, the truth is that like, a lot of people don't end up making a lot of money out in their house. Uh, Nashville was a little bit of an oddball in that the housing market was hot. Every once in a while, you'll hit a hot area. But in general, it, t people don't think of how much it costs to actually um, to fix up a house, to, to list it, to pay commission, to have it sit empty. And the last thing you want at the end of residency when you're about to take a new attending job in a different city or state or whatever is to have to deal with selling your house. So I recommend renting during residency. Um, the benefits are overstated, like the benefits, people always hear, like, I think this was set by the real estate people, like renting is throwing away money. Well, it's really not. The idea, you're, renting is not throwing away money. I want to get that across at least. Renting, paying rent gives you the ability to live in a place for a month. Like it is a reasonable transaction that many people pay and it's not throwing away money. Okay. Um, and when you buy a house, then you have to pay mortgage interest on your mortgage. You have to pay insurance, property taxes. You have to fix everything, at re-litter fees. And you're like, wait, that's throwing away money. So like, I mean, it's, don't think that once you buy a house, all of a sudden you're not going to be throwing away money. Once your social situation is set and your, um, your uh, financial situation, uh, your job, everything is set, go for it, buy a house. They've, there's some studies that say that if you own a house, you're actually less likely to, um, what is it, like you're less likely to be, uh, get a new job because you're so stuck in your spot. This wasn't for doctors, but a lot of people just didn't have the flexibility to move to a new job that they'd want to go to. Um, it's because of their house and they didn't want to sell their house. So wait until things are stable. And if you're going to buy a house, you know, we like to say keep it two times less than your gross income. So if you're making $300,000, keep it under $600,000 if you don't have a down payment. Um, if you do have a down payment, oh, I, I sorry, I used $200,000. I try to be nice. $200,000 and you want to live in a $500,000 house, you should have a $100,000 down payment. So your mortgage is only two times your salary. Now, granted, that his you'll see a lot of financial people say that a lot of times you have to break that rule, especially if you're living in Nashville or, you know, especially Northern California, Chicago, New York, a lot of these expensive uh, cost of living places, you're not going to be able to stay within this, but it should be a reasonable home. Let's just say that buy a reasonable home for your first home. You can buy a nice home when you're like 50 or whatever. 40 okay buy a 40 i keep my wife she keeps wanting to buy uh, like a, a nicer home i'm like we got a low interest rate we got a great home this is perfect all right buying versus renting this is another last thing some people say oh i'm paying two thousand dollars in rent i could have just bought a house with a mortgage of two thousand dollars which is about again a lot of assumptions built into here a three hundred seventy thousand dollar house and I should just be buying a house because I'm not throwing money away at least. But again, property taxes, insurance, maintenance. So your $2,000 rent is actually closer to a $1,400 mortgage plus a bunch of fees. So that's really like a, a $280,000 house. So don't compare rent to mortgage is the basis of this slide. There's a lot of additional costs that come in when you have a mortgage. All right, and finally, income taxes. You should file your taxes this year, even though most of you probably, I don't know, I should, I should say most of you didn't make any money. You have zero dollars, but guess what? This is really, really important for your, um, your income driven repayment plans. You want to prove to them that you had no income this year. So um, what you do is you go to a website and you file it online for free. Now, I do not take any money from anyone, but I will say TurboTax. I looked at, this was probably last year. I haven't looked this up again. TurboTax costs money. They say it's free in very select circumstances because they want to, you know, hook in. Um, but TurboTax, you know, they have ads all over the Super Bowl. You got to pay for those, you know, multi-million dollar ads. So TurboTax is a uh, very, and they pay 
they actually try to make it hard to file taxes for free. So they're actively against trying to make it free to file taxes. So I don't like TurboTax. HR Block is kind of middle range, it's a little bit cheaper, has more free situations for TurboTax, pretty easy user interface. Or if you want to use what I used to use up until I think two years ago, I, I, I did my own taxes for about 10 years. And then at some point my wife's like, just pay someone to do your taxes. And I felt like it was like a, an accomplishment every year. Like I could do my own taxes and you learn the system and you learn how to work the system. Not like illegally, but you understand how <laughs> things are done for taxes. And so I find it very helpful to do your own taxes. So I use free tax USA. It sounds made up. It sounds like a scam. It is not. I've used it for a decade. It is listed on the IRS website. If you go to the IRS website, they will list a couple different companies that you can go to in a random order and free tax USA comes up. So it's on the IRS website. Um, and it's free for even complex situations. I don't think I've ever paid free tax USA to file my taxes because they, they do charge for state income tax filing, but guess what? Tennessee doesn't have any state income tax. So, um, I've, uh, they, I've used their product for free, um, for quite a long time. So, and I don't have a referral link there because I don't use it anymore. Just kidding. Um, okay, do I need a financial advisor? This is a common question. Well, are you willing to put uh, just maybe an hour or two, I shouldn't say a few, like one or two hours a month on your finances? If so, you probably don't need a financial advisor. And this includes like reading books and maybe looking at your accounts once a month. Like if you're willing to do that, you probably don't need your financial advisor, at least for a, a while. If you're like, I still don't even want to read a book. Okay, well, um, you can hire someone and it's great, but get someone that is fee-based, meaning they charge per hour. That sounds a little weird, but you want to pay someone per hour to do the work because the other option is to pay someone as a percentage of your portfolio. And so some people will say, oh, I'll give you financial advice, but I charge you 1% of what they call assets under management fee, AUM fee. And you're like, oh, 1%. Yeah, let's do that. Well, guess what? 1% doesn't sound like a lot but I won't show you like the graph of like 1% over the course of your life when your, your guys' retirement accounts will be multi-million dollars at some point in your life. And 1% is a lot of money, especially for, they're really not doing anything more, uh, anything different than when it was $50,000 or $20,000 retirement account. They're doing maybe like a couple extra clicks, um, but uh, they're, it could cost you over half a million dollars over 30 years if they're doing assets under management fee. So find someone that will do it for, you know, 100, 100 bucks an hour or a couple hundred bucks an hour. Hopefully it won't be a couple hundred, but a hundred, $150 an hour and spend a couple hours with them to do a financial plan and look things over or evaluate. And yeah, it's going to cost you 500 bucks, but that's better than getting stuck with an asset center management fee. Okay. This is, I, the white coat investor had uh, recently said this, and I like this. Here is a book by William Bernstein. If you've never heard his name, he's a very big person in finances, and he was a doctor. He was a neurologist. Um, he stopped. He's he's probably around 80 now. Um, he wrote many financial books, but he was a trained neurologist, and so he talks a lot at White Co Investor stuff because everyone likes a combination of doctor and you know financial person. Um, he wrote a free PDF that's 14 pages online, and if you can't read this, you need a financial advisor. So this is your litmus test to, to know if you need a financial advisor or not, is this book. These slides, I'll give you these slides as well. Okay, to summarize, avoid debt. So there is a concept of good debt, which you, most of you guys have taken on good debt to get a doctor, you know, a medical degree. Okay, I get it. There's good debt to buy a house, a mortgage to get a reasonable house. Yes, okay, but don't become numb to getting debt. Don't say, oh, it's just another $30,000 on top of my $300,000. Okay, next is you gotta determine if you're doing public service loan forgiveness. You might not know right now, that's fine, but once you know for sure, do one or the other. Do Just go all in public service loan forgiveness with a side fund if you want, or refinance your loans in residency and uh, pay them off as soon as possible. Save money, again, 20% of your pre-tax money. So put this into one of those three accounts, savings account, retirement account, or paying off loans. I guess it's not an account, but start paying off loans. Um, if you're, especially if you're uh, not doing public service loan forgiveness, invest your uh, money in a retirement account in a broadly diversified low cost index fund. Again, consider either the target date funds that we mentioned, if you don't want to deal with it, 
or the S&P 500 index fund. Those are two great options with one single fund taking care of your entire, uh, entire investment portfolio. Strongly consider renting a house during residency. Many of you won't listen to this, but that's fine. File your federal income taxes this year. It's really important if you're doing public service loan forgiveness to do this. You can go to Free Tax USA, just put a bunch of zeros everywhere and hit submit. Well, read, read how you're supposed to do it. But in general, it's probably gonna be a bunch of zeros for you guys. It's not gonna take very long. It's gonna be zero dollars. And now you will have proof to the government. You will have documentation that you had a zero dollar income this year and that your um, repayment is uh, usually gonna be lower. And you have, what, three weeks to do it. And try to read a few books during um, before and during residency. So it's great to get on a good financial footing early. This didn't happen in the olden days of doctors. There's a lot of mid to late career doctors that didn't get good financial advice. Um, I think that's changing, especially with White Coat Investor and the other um, blogging doctors. They're giving a lot of good advice and reaching a lot of people. Um, so just remember, you're going to have to manage at least um, a portion of your uh, of all your money, maybe your whole family's money. And you're gonna, they, cause they say that you're going to be the, uh, the what the the COO, a CFO of your uh, family, whether you like it or not. Um, you might be able to offload it to your spouse if you're lucky. Uh, all right, so questions. I'm happy to take them. Um, the number one question you always get is, should I, what should I do with my money? Should I pay off my debt or should I invest? Um, that is a very specific question. Hopefully I kind of answered it. 